of the Fremantle County Board of Supervisors to order. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and Um, so we're jumping right into it. There's no report or anything like no, that, right? Yep, no report or All anything right. this, this evening. Um, we'll jump right into, uh, all the, uh, pre uh, presentations or any discussion. Okay. Well, um, first up is, uh, the amazing and talented Dr. Denise Bonds. And I think, I think actually on the call, I'm not sure if Dr. Bonds is on, um, I think we have uh, Dick Leary, who's the uh, director of administration for, All right. for Blue Ridge Health District. So, well, Mr. Leary, uh, whenever you're ready, we will we will be glad to hear your presentation. Sure. Good evening, um, board, uh, Eric, everyone else. Uh, as Eric said, I'm Dick Leary, the director of administration for Blue Ridge Health District, uh, presenting on behalf of BRHD this evening. Um, Eric and I have met about this previously. Uh, it's fairly simple um, budget request. Uh, it's basically a 3% increase, and that is almost entirely to cover the increase in the JLARC local match for Fluvanna County for the next uh, fiscal year. Um, as some of you may or may not know, the state looked at all of the local matches statewide and um, I guess made a determination that going forward, every locality would go to a 45% local match. And so Fluvanna had a increase in FY22 of roughly 3%. And that increase will also look like a 3% increase in FY23 and then a 3% increase in 24 to get the local match up to 45%. So really all that I'm asking for is a increase to cover your local match um, percentage with and, and, the local, sorry, go ahead. No, and I was just gonna say, it's not something that the county really has a, a say in the matter necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's, there's some localities that have already been at their match um, and there's some localities that were below. So instead of doing it all at once, there's a, a kind of a phase and approach to get those localities that are below up to the up to the up to the forty five percent as 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 he stated. Yeah, it's correct. So we have several different localities in our district are kind of on this, not necessarily the same exact plan, but a similar phased increase approach with the goal being that all the localities will be at forty five percent by. FY25. Um, and so what that looks like for Favana is a roughly 3% increase uh, each year to get us there. And so the rest of it is uh, basically leaving your local only the same, just getting increasing the local match. Uh, clinical services is uh, my best guess. We saw, you know, COVID obviously disrupted clinical services significantly. And so you, you can see there what our FY21 actual was, uh, which was still pretty down compared to FY19 actual. Um, and so this is my best approximation as we move to more endemic stage and everything else, what we'll see from clinical services as we continue to reopen those, uh, you know, throughout, throughout the district, uh, as well. Um, so kind of looking at a, you know, slight increase from FY21, uh, actual contributions across the board. So, so to just to go back, just to kind of look at their budget document, what that really means. And again, you can see right there. So they're going from FY fiscal year 22 from 277,884 to for this fiscal year, 286, 221. Um, so again, it'll be a, you know, a phase in approach of the increase. And again, that 286, 
then matches uh, and this is, again matches right there the locality contribution of 286 221 again their whole budget's not the 855 that's including some state portion the locality match is the 286 correct yeah Any questions? Is he here, Mr. Booker? Oh, you okay. know, I always have a question. <laughs> I mean, not really. But, I, but I always wonder why we do not have a nurse in the county. Uh, yes. Working. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we're working on the MAP program now. And usually they come out with some deficiencies. And they're looking at basically disparities in, in health service. So go ahead and answer me. I mean, <laughs> sure. So the question is, why, why isn't there a nurse? Yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, the district as a whole is facing a shortage uh, in nursing in public health. It's, we recently lost nurses in Louisa. Um, as you may be aware, the demand for nurses across the country is astronomical. Uh, and quite frankly, we just can't offer the kind of pay that they're offering travel nurses these days. Uh, travel nurses are being offered anywhere from five to $6,000 a week. Um, and that's almost, you know, 10% of what we pay a nurse in a year. So that's kind of what we're faced with is that the private sector demand for nursing is so incredibly high right now that it's really hard for us to a attract and then b retain qualified nurses. And that's across the district. Like I said, we recently just lost two other public health nurses that went to pursue other opportunities. Uh, so it's something that we're working on and we try to, you know, we don't like to have nursing vacancies because it, then we do, you know, we do provide coverage to the district, to every locality with the nursing staff that we have uh, at any given time, but that's obviously not ideal, but it is something that we constantly work to strive to fill all of our nursing positions. It's just incredibly difficult to do. Yes. Thank you for your answer. Um, I, I guess I'm an old school I don't know how long ago when we did have a county nurse, I think Kathy Apperson. So we have been without a county nurse for a long time, I think even before the COVID came. So that's still my concern. I, I hear what you're saying, I understand that, but I will continue to ask for that and hopefully we'll be able to afford one in the near future. It's so important, the county nurse, in my opinion. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much for all your hard work and to your entire team there. I appreciate the presentation. Certainly. Okay, moving on next, the Fluvenna SPCA, Ms. Mancini, Caitlin, President. Hello. Hello. So, so, so just a little bit, um, so we met with uh, Jerry Russell and Caitlin Mancini um, during uh, budget time to kind of go through their review. Um, again, fiscal year 22, the current fiscal year that we're in right now, their, their budget is 338,000. Um, what is in my proposed budget is 343. And just to kind of tell you a little bit of, about that, so every year they, they request what's the baseline plus, which is 100% of their full operations. But from that, we've, we've met with them and, and we've come to agreed upon percentages based upon different categories. Um, you know, we looked at, uh, in, in the past, we looked at what percentage of services is the FSPCA handling on behalf of the county versus kind of what they're doing privately on their own. Again, we've, the county needs to have an animal shelter. And instead of having to go build our own building and have our own staff, we, we, we pay for the FSPCA to kind of handle that operation. 
So when you go down here and look at percentages for what these different categories, what we deem to be um, Fluvanna's portion of that, again, and when you look at the personnel, all those items in yellow, um, and it's kind of been determined overall that um, for an animal shelter, that Fluvanna County, the volume that goes through there and the type of calls that we account for 75% of their, of their uh, intake for animals. Um, again, there's some other things like fundraising expenses. Uh, again, they didn't have any, but if they did, we would be responsible for 0% of their fundraising expenses. Or like for instance, routine or critical care, we're responsible for 50%. And 75% for some of the other uh, areas as well. So, so basically, their full request based upon those determined percentages, we then come up with what is what is the uh, the county admin proposed budget for them. So, and I'll let Caitlin or, or Jerry chime into any of that. And can I just ask a question? Yeah, I'm just pulling random. Yep. Microchipping, 100%. Yep. Um, so we, we've got an agreement with, with the FSPCA, and per our agreement, any animal that comes in on behalf of the county, we require there to, we wanted there to require to be microchipping of all the animals so we knew kind of what was coming in, and, and so we didn't have repeat animals. So, so in the county's agreement, we wanted that in there, so we were responsible for 100% of that. That was not something that they were necessarily doing. So all those 75% of the inflow in regards to Fluvanna County. Any of the animals that come in based upon what the county, um, the intake from uh, county intake, we want all those animals to be microchipped. And spayed and neutered. They yes. have to be spayed Correct. and neutered before they leave. Yeah, and like I said, it, like I said that's just, yeah, I, I didn't show you the whole, again, it says microchipping, spay and neuter. That was part of our agreement. When mm -hmm. you say coming from the county, do we mean from animal control? Yes. Okay. Yep. So I'm just, I guess I'm missing between the 100% and the others at 75%. Um, we're going to microchip, spay, and neuter 100%. Uh, so, so, so of the animals that come in through animal control, we want 100% of those animals. Um, to be microchip, spayed, and neuter. Um, and, and maybe Jerry or Caitlin, maybe you can chime in on this because prior before, not, that wasn't happening with all animals. Is that correct? Well, we've, I, I can only speak for the last five years, but um, so as long as I've been doing this, we've been spay and neutering everybody that walks out the door um, unless they're transferred to another shelter and, and we've been doing a pretty good job of trying to help with that. But um, so everybody that comes in previously to changing the percentages and things, you were giving us so much per animal and that just wasn't feasible for what our cost was. It, it didn't cover. So that's why we changed it to these numbers. Mr. Fairchild, what I can do, I haven't, I haven't, like I said, the agreement was in place before before I was in this position. So I can go back and look and see. Uh, I don't recall 100%. I remember there was discussion that the county wanted to make sure that all animals were microchipped and spayed and neuter. And, and so I don't, Yeah. I see saying if we're, if we're paying 75% for everything else, why are we, why are we not paying 75% for that? Yeah, and I'm not even... Uh, or why aren't you paying 100%, right? I understand yeah. why one's different than the others. Uh, I'll go back and double check that. Like I said, I haven't, uh, like I said, it's an annual renewal contract. Is okay. it, and, and just to confirm that. Okay. Is there anything else? Any other questions? Any other questions from the board? No. Okay. Um, how how has it been during COVID? I have that question for you guys. How's how have operations been overall, and how's that affected your staffing? Well, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we've been well, certainly through COVID, our numbers have been down. However, um, and our staff have been happy, and <laughs> in in a way that they've 
kind of had to find some things to do. However, kitten season, it seems like comes every year, regardless if we're through COVID or not. Um, and we are full of dogs right now. So the staff is, dogs, yeah. is, so they are overwhelmed back to being overwhelmed um, mm -hmm. too. And a lot of our, our budget too went to extra PPE and having to have extra cleaning measures and that sort of thing, extra supplies for that. Um, and getting back, I mean, I guess saying getting back to it, we're two years into COVID. Um, it has been, it is, our numbers have slowed by adoption and foster rates. I mean, we have, we have weekly, I feel like Jerry and I have weekly discussions with the staff um, to get these animals posted online, but truly being a little, I don't know if we're understaffed right now, but it seems like we're constantly. For the first time we, we have fully staffed for the first time in a while. It doesn't last, but. It doesn't last, right. I was going to say it doesn't last. So they, uh, if we're fully staffed right now, which is fantastic, it seems like that kind of ebb and flows. And then they get overwhelmed with tasks needing to be done at the shelter, not just walking animals, but when you, we are at capacity, that takes three to four times as long for any, you know, having people come in and going through routine things in terms of interacting with the public on top of cleaning cages, going through the intake process and that sort of thing. And there's been a lot of morale issues in the last couple of years, just because people still are, you know, getting sick and then somebody else has to cover while somebody else is out on COVID, you know, recuperation. So it's, it's been a challenge. It's, it's a tough job for these people. Yeah. I mean, even Harry, I mean, some of our staff members have really had medical issues um, coming up just from hearing, I wouldn't say hearing loss, but these, you know, these emotional, you have no idea. You should go for a day and just see these, these animals that they take in. It's not just something that they do every day and can walk dogs and clean cages. I mean, this is an emotional toll um, on our staff and it is hard on morale. I mean, we're trying, we come up with try to have different strategies and things to sort of boost, um, you know, overall teamwork and team ethic, but our, our manager works hard. I mean, she really does. She's, she's worked hard. Um, and that was also a part of, I think a part of the budget was an increase mm -hmm. in her in her salary this year as well, because she was, I wouldn't say threatening, but she was saying, I wanted, she wanted to go somewhere else. Um, and she's the glue. She, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, she, she's really grown in her position and her skill. And, um, I, I think we were just really trying to make her happy, but also be a part of sort of a, an annual increase, um, and, and a well-earned annual increase. Absolutely. Any other questions? No. Well, thank you uh, to the board and to the staff for all the hard work that you do and taking care of the creatures that, that make Fluvanna better. And uh, I, I can say I have a, a, a lovely dog that we adopted from the Fluvanna SPCA. And we we love thank very you. Much. We thank you. <laughs> Spread the word. Adopt, don't I shop. Will. I will. <laughs> All right. Um, next, we have the cooperative extension, Mrs. Kim Mayo, extension agent. Hello. You can go okay. ahead and look to the next slide. Through, this is a very brief presentation, and it's just to highlight the services that you're paying for. Our increase this year is in our contract services line, as it is just about every year. So, I want to make sure you understand what you're paying for. So. In our office, we have um, four permanent staff. We have a part-time program assistant position that is currently vacant, has been vacant for two quarters. We've been unable to successfully hire a candidate. So we're really struggling filling those positions. If you note the two positions that have a red asterisk beside them, our unit support staff and our family nutrition program, senior program assistant, those do not have any county dollars allocated to those positions. They are either 100% state funded or federally funded. So we're bang for your buck, I guess, is the best way to say that. That is approximately 70% of the contract services line right there. Next slide, please. Uh, approximately 30% of your contract services line is coming from agents that are not housed in our county, but are at our fingertips. So we can't be an expert in everything. Um, you might have a horticulture question, you might have a cattle question or a pond question. 
we have these folks at our fingertips so that we can get service to our residents. Um, the two family and consumer sciences agents are housed in Louisa and in Albemarle. So think about that population that they also have to serve. They're not necessarily in Fluvanna one day a week, um, but they certainly are there when we need them and when we request them. The ag and natural resources agents, those are kind of our specialty folks. So we definitely lean on them. Can you um, define contract services? Sure, that's our salary line. You can go ahead and input to the um, to the budget sheet if that helps. Yeah, we'll just do that that just yeah no worries, good question. So contract services is the bulk of our, of our budget. And basically that's what Virginia Tech um, bills the county for salaries. <laughs> They say, you know, here are the positions that you have um, a cost share agreement with, and this is how much it will cost to have them in your unit. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Fairchild, if you just look here, so yeah. you got the, so here's their total budget. Again, current year is 105, you're requesting 107. So the contract services line, this is where the county pays um, Virginia Tech mm -hmm. for, for, as Ms. Mayo said, uh, a portion of salaries. And then they have some other small an ancillary other uh, line items in their budget too for some other program costs, but the bulk of it is in, in, in the contractual services line. And that's basically the bulk of if there's any changes on a yearly Sorry, basis. Yep. Great question. Again, the supplies that you um, contribute, you know, office supplies and stuff like that, we haven't had an increase in requests in several years there. So again, I just wanted to kind of explain how that, that works. We're only able to meet the needs of our residents because of our volunteers. You can go ahead to the next slide. I just wanna highlight the impact. And this is again, a 2020 number, the volunteer um, dollar figure based on that $26 per hour contribution, um, our 4-H volunteers, in fact, $50,000 worth of impact, I guess, back to the county. And for every dollar you put in, approximately $1.75 in service back to our residents. So I just wanted to highlight that our volunteers are key. You know, I'm, I'm one 4-H agent that works with youth I can't do it alone. So just wanted to highlight those. So are there any, um, I guess just two more to, to highlight our senior garden at the, the community center. I couldn't, couldn't have a moment in front of you without highlighting that, um, using that as an educational tool, holding programs and classes there for our community members to be engaged in. Yeah, I was down there yesterday. It's beautiful. Yeah. Grant, grant funded, you know, that garden didn't cost, you know, Fluvanna County anything other than it's sitting yeah. on your property. 100% um, grant funded for that project. It is beautiful. If you've not had a chance to see it, come by. We'd love to give you a tour. All right, next slide. And basically any, any questions that you might have regarding our budget this year? So, um, first of all, I think it's great to have, but just wondering operationally how it's designed. So do we, is the uh, relationship that we don't have to have the extension in Fluvanna County, but if we do, here's the cost of that. Correct. We have a memorandum of understanding with Virginia Tech saying that, you know, this is the service we provide. If you provide this portion, the state will provide the remaining portion for you. So whatever you all say, it's either have it or, or not, right? Correct. You, yeah, if you, way, like certainly. No, no problem. I'll stand here and advocate for extension any day of the yeah. week, not just because I work for them. I'm a product of their program. So. Yeah. Um, if you say, you know, I, we have to give you a 20% or even a 10% reduction, um, that's, that's people. That's why I wanted to highlight that, you know, <laughs> the bulk of our budget request is, is positions and salary. Yeah. So but there's no negotiating. Here's what you need. And I understand it. Yeah. yeah, that's what they bill for. They handle all of that as well. Um, salary billing, management, HR, um, you just get the bill and say here, and yeah, you provide the space. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no kind of back and forth saying, you know, we want right. to. If, 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 if we want to negotiate or, or, or trim, then, then, right. then they're going to have to decide what, what program is, is kind of being phased, phased out or going away or minimized. Right. Now, um, let's not just talk about minimize. Let's talk about expand. So let's say, you know, those family consumer science agencies that provide um, nutrition education and financial education, we really want one here. That would come at about, you'd have to fund that 100% because there are no state positions available. That would have a price tag of about 80,000 with salary and fringe on average. Just, just food for thought. If that's something that you know you wanted to entertain additional positions fully funded by the county, that's the number that I was provided so, so yesterday. It's not a menu, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Okay. So it's not it's not everything or nothing. It's what it, as you said, it's what are you willing to give up? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean what you're willing to give up, what you're willing to add. I mean and and, and you know we haven't 
you know, I, I don't think the county's ever really been in, in, into a, a point where it's really discussed, you know, what programs we don't or, or do or do not want from the cooperative extension. Um, it's It's been pretty streamlined for, for, for many years now. And I think certainly supportive from the board, uh, recognizing the value that we are able to provide to our citizens. Um, the, it, the major increase over the last five years was a program assistant designed to work for youth specifically during the day to assist teacher programs. We can't fill that position right now and I'm desperate to do so. Um, so recognizing that value and saying, sure, you know, we would like to contribute to this effort. Um, we're happy to at any means, we so, will happily work with you. So, and also too, if they have vacancies, like for instance, the program assistant, right. if they have vacancies, we're not getting billed. We're obviously not getting billed by Virginia Tech for, for a, a vacant position. That's what I was gonna ask. Yes. You said this hadn't been able to fill it. So what's happening with that money and we're not being billed for it. Correct, it stays, it will just roll over. It's not something I can say, oh, hey, I've got this extra money just sitting here. Can I use it for this? It's in contract services. Yep, that's, that's committed to salary. You won't receive a bill for somebody who's not on the payroll. Yeah, so if we had like $100,000 in contract services and, and there was positions in, in overlap or just vacancies yeah. throughout the year, maybe we're billed 90,000 out of that 100,000. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So, Great questions. Any other questions? The last time we had an intern. We had an intern in 2020, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to host that um, virtually and in person. Oh. So that person was able to telework some and lead some uh -huh. virtual programs, but also led in-person programs. Mm -hmm. We did not feel that we could justify that in 2021 with the limiting the limitations that we were imposed on. Mm -hmm what we were allowed to do with in-person programs. We have an application out now for a 2022 intern. So that position will be posted. Actually, it's live on the Virginia Tech site now. And I hope the advertisement will be out trying to get us a program assistant and an intern at the same time. So great yeah. question. I can't believe you don't have a kitchen question for me, but I was going to ask I'll, about the kitchen. I'll, as a matter of fact, I'll leave before. Yeah. Certainly um, we're in progress. And if, I don't know if Aaron's on the call or not, but there's, we are yes, that's yes. close, Mr. O'Brien. Um, we are working on approval from the health department. And the last step to my knowledge is a capacity assessment for the septic system there, which we feel confident that it will pass, but it does have to be just one item checked off the list. But that was the last item provided by the health department that we need to. Okay. To Do you have any sense of the demand that you'll have for it? Oh, I think two years ago, I had a great sense. Yeah. So uh, right. um, I do know with the pandemic, there were some increases in home-based businesses, yeah. right? Um, some folks were able to telework and maybe, you know, pr promote their business from home, but I don't have a demand currently. And I'm, a, I'm hesitant to advertise, right. not knowing when we will have it ready to open. Yeah. So, yeah. Great question. So the end of the board. I don't know what we're talking sure. about. In the, in the community center at Fork Union, where our Virginia Cooperative Extension office is housed, um, several years ago, John Thompson, my predecessor, um, put an application for a community kitchen that could be certified commercial kitchen for home-based entrepreneurs to kind of grow their business and be able to rent a kitchen that's inspected. So it would give them a whole different audience for their product, um, affordably able to rent that facility without having to have the capital at home. Um, we, we have the equipment, it is there. We just are waiting on that final piece from the health department approval. And that, that, that's been a, that's the commercial kitchen has been a, a work in progress for some time. If, if Mr. Weaver was here, uh, he would ask many questions. About he would be having kitchen. a coronary right now. <laughs> I, it was my goal before he left, but I, I couldn't, you know, COVID is still I thought real. it was already open, so. Uh, <laughs> So the, the insulation costs, so you've, you've got all the equipment, mm -hmm. the notable installation costs because of getting the hoods up through yep. commercial, commercial standards and yeah. all that. Who's paying for that? That has been paid for. Most of that was through county funds. Yeah. Um, some of it was done in-house with county staff actually completed a good chunk of that work. Some plumbing had to be contracted out, for example. Um, it's there. It's sunk cost at this point, I know, but I, I do feel like there is demand there. We, we have people call and say, is it, is it open? No. Yeah, I, I, I want to say probably time. about three, four years ago, all the equipment was kind mm -hmm. of Kind it's of in, finally put in, in and place. ready to go, and then kind of COVID hit, and then I know on this Mayo and Mr. Spitzer have been kind of engaging mm -hmm. back again with with the Virginia Department of Health to try and get all the all the um, certifications and sign offs mm -hmm. that they need to be able to 
you know, obviously market it more and, and see what home-based businesses would be interested in that. And it's not sitting dormant and shuttered. Uh, we do utilize it for instruction as well. So we can use it as a teaching kitchen in the meantime, but that's certainly not the, the intent of the project. And, and it's been used, I think, too, at times. I know when there was like the, the senior centers there. Mm -hmm. so, so during some senior meals, now the meals weren't cooked there, but it's been used as a, as a preparation space and stuff like that for, for senior, uh, senior center functions and, and things like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Oh, I, I think I know one thing that Mr. Fairchild was going to ask next, and that's who's going to change your filters? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to walk this way now. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Uh, all right. Next is uh, library, Ms. Cindy Hoffman, director. Good evening. It's nice to see everybody in person. <laughs> I've been doing Zoom. Um, just a quick outline of everything that we've done over the last year. Our circulation did drop. Um, at one point, we were one of five libraries in the state that was providing service. So a drop in circulation was better than no circulation, I think. Um, and actually, ebook circulation increased quite a bit. So that helped out a lot. Um, we did summer reading last year. We did it outside and we did it in the heat. It was great. We had lots of programs and we did, we served um, 283 kids and teens with 75% of them completing the entire program, um, which is an all time high, actually. Um, it was exciting that so many kids could complete the program and we actually had a donated Nintendo Switch for anybody that completed, completed the program got entered into a drawing for the Nintendo Switch. Um, and this group with four boys won. <laughs> and that family comes in and checks out Nintendo Switch games every week. They're getting well used out of that. Um, we picked up during COVID grab and go kits, um, providing over 2000 monthly kits. And then during the summer, we switched to provide about 2100 weekly kits to preschool kid, teen and adult which was kind of nice. Um, actually, the adults are the most popular and we run out of those every time we do a kit. Um, we did story time. We did um, in the fall and spring, we did it over Zoom and then we switched to outdoors. We've been using that front porch on the library. It's the perfect spot for it. Um, and then even <coughs> through the fall and winter, as it got colder, we had patio heaters out there. We've been doing it out there and now we're inside because it's too cold to do outside. Um, next. Just to let you know, our funding for the library comes from local funding and state aid. Um, state aid is based on a per capita formula, and we are at $15.53 per capita, and we have to maintain at least an $11.66 per capita, um, or we could lose state aid. Above that, we are ranked 77 out of 93 libraries in local per capita support. So. When I came here in 08, we were the last library in the state. So we've moved up. We're doing good. When was that that you came? 2008. Revenues. During COVID, we suspended all fines. We stopped charging for faxes. We noticed a lot of our faxing was um, workman's comp, unemployment, veterans affair, um, veterans benefits, health insurance issues. So we figured with um, people laid off, we just stopped charging. We have now reinstated those charging and we started charging again in September. Um, we are also getting revenue from the state. This next budget year, it's estimated to get $114,425. When I came in 2008, we were getting $49,000. So we've more than doubled that. And, and, and just one thing on the zero for fines, faxes, and copies. I think your average per year is about 10,000. It is. Yeah. Yep. We average about 10,000. So, and I feel like um, we're bringing in quite a bit now, actually. So, um, Next slide. So in the county administrator's um, budget, we, our budget line is 455,942. 114 of that is for state aid. So the local funding request is $341,517. Do you have any questions for the library? 
Um, I was just listening to a podcast this season before coming in randomly. It's it about how people learn. And randomly, uh, it, it brought up, it said, how do people, if they wanted them to, to learn and continue to grow in their education, how did they do it in the 90s? They went to the library. How, how did they do it today? They go to the internet. And understanding much so the county still doesn't have good access to the internet. Right. Um, what I'm going to say is out of my ignorance, but I, I sometimes think about the library and I think who still goes there when there's so much information available on the net. So is it, is it, but he has the internet, which will come pretty soon. Who's still coming to the library? So we're actually, um, we provide traditional services, in-person print physical items. We also have a consortium of 16 libraries providing eBooks, downloading e um, regular eBooks, audiobooks, um, videos, streaming videos. Um, and they actually just um, bought out Canopy, which is all streaming videos. And they own the Acorn collection and a lot of the BBC stuff. So they are gonna have an agreement there. So we'll be able to provide that as well. Um, they also provide the great courses and all of the National Geographic materials, eBooks and streaming videos. So we'll provide the in-person materials and we do story time. I feel like story time is always going to be a thing, especially for families and young kids. We have a large homeschool population in Flavana um, and I see a lot of that. I have several families that have eight to 15 kids and they're not gonna get stuff on the internet. They don't even believe in the internet except for streaming educational materials. And so some of that stuff, they'd have to subscribe to something if they did want to get it off the internet. Right, whereas, whereas we get it and we can do it for free. Um, through the State Library, we also have a program called Universal Class and that has um, how to use the internet, how to use your word processor, how to use your Excel, your all the Microsoft products and it's video, educational videos, as well as how to crochet, how to knit. Um, let's take a basic watercolor class. Um, in October every year, they have how to tell if your house has a ghost, and like just random classes and educational classes. They've added a new program this year that we provide through the State Library that has um, live homework help, like a, like a Zoom session. It's not on Zoom, but it's like a Zoom session with a certified teacher and a child, and they can get homework assistance in any topic including writing assistance. They also have a part of that program includes um, help for veterans with resources and um, transitioning out of the military or just help. Um, and then they also have, um, like if you're trying to get new jobs or make a new resume, they have all that assistance as well. And that's all online. So I think it's gonna become more of a combination of in-person stuff and online stuff. Um, we see a lot of retired folks that still come to the library and get stuff. We see so a lot of families. Books, so how many books did up circulate this year? How many we circulated have, this year? It was, um, it did go down, yeah, but it was like almost 130. Yeah, the first slide, it was like 130,000. Right, yeah, people still want that book. Yep, people yeah. still and, do. And I don't question it. Just, mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought of the analogy, Blockbuster versus Netflix. Yep. Um, you know, blockbuster mm -hmm. went away and, and now everybody gets it online and I just wondered. We were a little concerned during COVID so many people got internet at home. A lot of people got Netflix at home that could. In Fluvanna, not everybody could get high-speed internet. And I'm actually seeing them coming back now and say, oh, well, that was great when um, my job would subsidize the pay to have this high-speed internet at home so I could get Netflix and stuff. Yeah, and now I'm, I don't want to pay that anymore. So they're coming back and checking out movies. And you get a lot of students as well too. We get a lot of students. We actually see a lot of homeschool families. Um, I've, and a lot of the, like um, the Light Academy, which is one of the private schools, they actually come every once in a while on a Friday, they bring a busload of kids for kids to get stuff. So, cause their library is different than our library. So, um, so it, it's working well with the partnerships that we have. And, and, and not to mention too that uh, Miss uh, Miss Hoffman in the library got a got a Baker Achievement or, or mm -hmm. uh, Innovation Award for for all the programming that she was doing during COVID with all the grab and go kits and everything to kind of yeah. still keep families engaged with with what the library was doing. My favorite right now is Spice of the Month Club, and you can come in and on the fourth Saturday of every month you get a sample of the spice, information, and recipes. 
but I like to cook. So we're doing curry powder this Saturday. <laughs> I'm going to try curry powder. Congratulations to another Fresh turmeric you can buy at Food Lion. We did turmeric last month. Is that right? Yeah. Very cool. We're, um, we started it, we were giving out about 70 samples and we're up over almost 150 now. Are you still month. giving out uh, COVID kits, uh, test kits? We are out of kits. We gave out over 3,000 kits and we have an order in as soon as they have a supply <coughs> order, send us more. Okay, um, but yeah, they, they flew. Like we did over 400 kits in 30 minutes one day. Wow. Um, wow. Any other questions from the board? No. Thank you for all you're doing, Mrs. Hoffman. Thank you. Team as well, too. All right. Next, we have the registrar, Mr. Pace. Yeah. So Miss so Miss Pace is out of town on a on a training, and and unfortunately, the, uh, there's three electoral board members. The two more senior ones that have been there for a while, they were not available this evening. Um, so there's really no one here to present on behalf of the registrar's office. Um, Again, I've worked with Ms. Pace on her budget a little bit, kind of going throughout here. Not a whole lot's changed. You know, the only thing that her actual her budget is less this year than it was last year, and just the the main component of that is to just you know, kind of one of her bigger expenses is when you're looking at um, you know election costs and primaries and stuff. Sometimes she has to budget for you know potentially two primaries and election. Well, for this fiscal year, it's um. She's only having a budget for a November election and one one potential June primary. So, you know, it, it's roughly around 20, 25,000 less because there's one less primary she's budgeting for. So that's kind of really kind of some of the big change when you look at the total of what's in my budget versus um, what's in her current fiscal year 22 budget for the 362,000. Um, but again, her, you know, she's got um, she's got folks in her office that are that, that do the early voting. So she's got part time people that are there, you know, for the 45 days prior to voting. Uh, in addition, you know, she also has contractual services, you know, workers, those that come in for just the one day for, you know, gen, uh, more than one day, maybe three days to do training and, and then do the actual primaries and elections. But that's kind of really the, the biggest piece of her budget is, is the people associated with the elections and, and certainly, you know, cost to run the elections. Um, so the new poll is in the budget at Beaver Dam? New polling place. New well, poll. yes, I mean, again, we're not, we're not changing what we're doing. We're, we still have one, we still have one polling uh, place for, for Palmyra. Yeah, no, Beaver Dam. Yeah, 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 Beaver Dam is no, not any more expensive. No. Okay, that's, no. that's all. No. Yeah, you've answered. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so yes. Okay. Yep. That's and and so the sort of real cost of early voting has been absorbed now. It is. I mean, it, essentially it, the what the twenty budget to the yeah. If you look at the budget. twenty to the twenty one, that was probably the biggest the biggest increase right there, going from <laughs> about two twenty a year up to three four. <laughs> having to have the, the staffing in there you know because again for, for the early voting for every election or primary it's 45 days prior to if it's a primary or election so you know you've got to have at least in in the in which is the registrar's office serves as the uh, central absence absentee precinct so you've got to have at least in addition to the normal folks that they have in there on a daily basis, at least two to three in addition on a daily basis for 45 days um, from those that are, you know, ch uh, checking identification coming in, those that are monitoring in the, in the voting area. And, and so, so yeah, that's, that's been absorbed at this point. So now that's kind of just part of the base of the budget, that 45 day early voting. Well, and, and, and really part of the increase between 21 and 22 was the rental of the space as well too well yes yeah. but that's not included in here oh it's not no because <laughs> you know that that's that comes out of the general services <laughs> budget because okay. that's just a function of, of just the local uh, county government so really when you see some of the fluctuations in i mean one it's going to depend upon what election are the actual not, needs yeah. of elections but you're really looking at you know the big shift of you know do you have two three elections in a year. When I include election, I mean election and primaries already up to. Special election. Yeah, special election, things like that. 
other questions from the board? No. Do, do we know roughly what percentage of early voting was? Do you know that? I think it was in the 40% or something like that range. I would, I would hate to even comment on behalf of the registrar for that. I'm, I'm not. You can look it up by looking at the Virginia website. So I bet you, I bet you, Miss Harris, by the time we get into another budget, we can have that information for you at some point. <laughs> okay, great. All right, next uh, we have social services, Kim Maben. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, Mr. Fairchild. <laughs> Kim Mabe, I'm the Director of Social Services, and um, talk to you a little bit about our budget request, and you can go to the next. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, why it's important to maintain our current level of funding. Uh, the governor's budget includes a 5% pay increase for staff and um, our CIP request for one vehicle replacement. So this is um, our overall budget request. We are requesting um, $3,325,000 for fiscal year 23. This is about $7,500 less than our fiscal year 22 budget. And you can um, see that it's broken out. 35% of that is local funds, 22 is state and 43% of our budget is federal funds. And the way our budget works is the local funds are used as a match to draw down the state and federal funds. So for example, and this is very generally speaking because our state budget lines, every budget line has a different match rate. But if a third of our budget is local funds, if, for example, you reduced our local funding by 5,000, that's our match for 10,000 in state and federal funds. So it would actually be reducing our budget by 15,000. Um, and also the way our, our budget works, we are state supervised locally administered. And so you appoint a social services board that administers the local department of social services in Fluvanna. And the social services board has discretionary power over local funding in our budget. Thanks, Frank. Um, this was fiscal year 21, um, $1.3 million in local funds was spent on social services in Fluvanna. Um, and with that $1.3 million investment, we spat out $45 million um, to the county. So, um, and most of that is paid out in benefits to our citizens. And so I'll show you a little bit about how that works. So, and that's money that hopefully comes back to the local economy as well. So the next slide. Um, again, we're state supervised. We exist to administer mandated state and federal programs to residents of our county. Um, and with our benefit programs, these are public financial assistance programs that we are responsible for determining eligibility for, and we provide ongoing case management. And these are the different benefit programs that uh, we administer through our office that are mandated. Um, most people have heard of Medicaid and SNAP. Uh, SNAP is uh, the new term for food stamps, but we also... Uh, determine eligibility for TANF few energy assistance, uh, 4E foster care, auxiliary grant, child care assistance, general relief, and refugee resettlement. Um, and we are required uh, to have a fraud and in, um, investigation staff that we also investigate fraud in our office. So, what is the refugee resettlement program? So that is a program we actually don't have any in Fluvanna, but if we were to have a refugee, it's a program where we work with them 
uh, to provide benefits and help acclimate them um, to the United States. Charlottesville and Albemarle actually has a pretty large uh, refugee resettlement program. So just people that the federal government have placed there? Or? Mm -hmm. So refugees are, they come from other countries and um, it has to be like, because of war, like civil war or something like that, that they're in danger. And the federal government works it out with these other countries that they'll accept so many uh, refugees in our country. And then they are, um, there's a lot in Harrisonburg and there's a lot in Charlottesville. Um, and then they are placed in certain areas where there's a program <laughs> set up to, to help them. Usually there's local churches involved, volunteer agencies as well too, right? Mm -hmm. Um, our services programs, these are, um, our programs where our responsibility is the protection and safety of the vulnerable residents uh, of Fluvanna County. And it's aimed, uh, primarily towards children and then, uh, disabled persons and persons 60 and older. Um, this is where we conduct investigations of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and we provide ongoing case management to provide protective services um, to folks. And we do that through adoption, um, APS, adult services, it's two different things, child protective services, in-home services, family support services, foster care, provider approval, and then court-ordered services that we also provide. Um, so a minute ago, when I was talking about the millions of dollars that we bring back into the county, um, this is how we do that. So this, these numbers were still in fiscal year 22. So these are fiscal year 21 numbers. Um, there was over $38 million paid out in Medicaid benefits to Fluvanna residents, uh, 5,546. 5, we averaged 65 new Medicaid applications a month that we processed. Um, there was three and a half million dollars paid out in SNAP benefits to Fluvanna residents, an average of almost $300,000 a month to over a thousand Fluvanna families. And we average around 52 new SNAP applications we process each month. And then 149,000 um, annual was paid out in TANF benefits um, to 50 families, and we get about seven new applications a month. Is there some overlap between the people on Medicaid and SNAP typically or in terms of the services that they're receiving? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks that receive both. Oh. There's a lot more, and, and you'll see that in some numbers um, I have in a future slide, but there's a lot more people who receive Medicaid. And um, for the people who receive SNAP and TANF, they probably receive Medicaid, but some people may receive Medicaid, but not necessarily SNAP or TANF. Yeah, it's, a, I'm, it's like, uh, what's, what's the percentage there of the population? 5,000, it's almost 4%, 5% of the population on Medicaid. 21% of Fluvanna residents receive Medicaid. 21. And that's one in five people in our county. Oh, my math is really off, sorry. Huh? I said my math was way off, sorry. <laughs> that's 21% receive Medicaid. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does that jive with the, quote, poverty level of 7% for the county? Seems like one, <laughs> one is off. It's three for this. Fluvanna is 7%. That was for the 2010. In that census, the 2020 yeah. census, yeah, 6.8, 6.8%. Yeah. So the federal poverty um, criteria is, is differs from what Medicaid eligibility and, and SNAP eligibility is. And, and Medicaid, the numbers went up significantly a few, month, a few years ago when Medicaid expansion passed in Virginia. It created a whole new... Um, category of people eligible for Medicaid. Um, and that is basically um, low wage. It's 
no wage on this, right? It's, it's people who work earning low wages. And prior to Medicaid expansion, the only people eligible for Medicaid were children or aged, blind, and disabled folks. So. And this is just um, other assistance um, that's paid out um, to our Fluvanna residents that receive childcare assistance, energy assistance, um, adoption assistance, about $326,000 in fiscal year 21 was paid out uh, for 21 Fluvanna children who were adopted from foster care. And at any point, please stop me if you have questions. <laughs> um, and this is just more assistance that's paid out um, through our office to Fluvanna residents through 4E foster care, that $300,000 offsets CSA funds. If it didn't come out of 4E, it would come out of CSA. The good thing about 4E, it's 100% federal dollars and CSA, there's a local match to that. Um, we paid out money to Fostering Futures. These are uh, foster children who age out, they turn 18 and they're on their own. And so we're still able to provide support to them after they turn 18. Um, we have two residents that are eligible for auxiliary grant assistance, and this is funding for assistant living facility placement, uh, general relief and uh, purchase of services. And this is uh, the numbers of folks who receive Medicaid and SNAP in the county. And so uh, Virginia Department of Social Services puts out um, a profile report annually for every um, Department of Social Services. And so I just really copy and pasted that from the state report, but it shows you the number of SNAP, TANF and Medicaid and child care recipients um, in the county. And you can see over the years, the number of people who received SNAP, it was going down every year until COVID. And um, then those numbers started to come back up. And then Medicaid, those numbers consistently um, have risen every year. The biggest increase from 2019 to 2020. And a lot of that has to do with um, Medicaid expansion. But not necessarily COVID. Right. Um, I think from, I think the increase that you see from 2020 to 2021, is due to COVID. So there was 5,840 residents in fiscal year 21 who received SNAP, TANF, and or Medicaid, and that's one in five people in the county. Ms. May, just one question. The, the, the column that says program, what's that mean? Uh, that means SNAP, TANF, and or Medicaid. That's everything. Oh, yeah. That's everything. Okay, um, I gotcha. Yeah, okay. unduplicated. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then next do you, slide. Do, you don't have a chart of um, how people qualify for uh, Medicaid family size, how much money can come into the home and for them to qualify? We, we do have that at the office. Yeah, I think sometimes it's mm -hmm. really interesting to see. And you um, can also go to the Common Help website yeah. and that information is there. If anyone um, wanted to apply for benefits, mm -hmm. but they wanted to know if they might be eligible before right. they go through um, the process of actually submitting an application, they can go to the Common Help website mm -hmm. and there's um, like a little checklist that mm -hmm. you can do there to see um, if you might be eligible, so you would know if it's worthwhile going right. through the application okay. process. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we have that information at the office. Would it be, is that something you can easily like get to us? Because that's something I'd like to see. I'd like to remember, I have no understanding. Of, like, is it just a sheet that, that mm -hmm. we can see that, that summarizes how people qualify? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a pam pamphlets, and I'm oh, happy okay. to I'm give you one. Mm -hmm. I will get one. Oh, yeah, the front lobby. 
We should probably get yeah. one for you before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can get you one before you leave. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. Family of three, 21,000. I mean, it's, it's really. This is a very complicated uh, part of the, the community. Um, I sit on the board, and Mrs. Booker had sat on the board too, and it's it's very it takes a lot of time to yes. to know what's going on, and you you do a great job. Great job! Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, you really do. Everything it's it's very complicated. Um, everything is very complex, from our budget to the programs. Um, most definitely, with our Medicaid applications. Sometimes um, if there's a complicated error property, um, you know, those cases go to the um, attorney general and we have mm -hmm. to wait until we get an answer from the attorney general before we can even finish processing right. the application. So Maybe it's excuse, pretty complex. Yeah, excuse me, Kim. Maybe tell, because um, Chris is in there, what is TANF? TANF is uh, temporary aid to needy families. It temporary, used to aid. Aid. Mm -hmm. yeah. it used to be um, ADC, which was aid to dependent children. It's what they used to call the welfare mm -hmm. um, check, but it's a lot different now with TANF. Um, for folks who receive TANF, they have to participate in the VIEW program, and that's where we work with folks to help them become self-sufficient so that they don't need to receive TANF anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we help um, assess the barriers to getting a job and keeping a job, and we provide That's services address. to address um, those barriers. And under welfare, did they not have to go through that? No. When it was AD, the old ADC, mm -hmm. um, they didn't. Yeah. That's a lot of work. That so that's a, a lot thing. of uh, welfare reform that's probably happened over the last 25 years. I think you started around 1994. <coughs> um, and this is just uh, some of our services numbers. Uh, again, I just copy and pasted this from our state profile report. And we can get slide and um, so this is some of our child welfare numbers we um, conducted 91 investigations and family assessments in fiscal year 21 we average about eight new investigations per month uh, we average about 17 in-home services and family support cases per month and these are cases that are at high risk for um, child abuse, and we provide services uh, to these children and families uh, to help prevent foster care. And outreaches, that's something that we do in Fluvanna that other social services don't do because it's not mandated. But if we receive a CPS report and it doesn't meet validity, um, we will still contact the family and let them know we received a report and we'll offer services okay. to them. And then we've averaged about 20 children in foster care each month in Fluvanna. Are all of them in Fluvanna? Oh, do you have do you have some other places, other counties? They are placed everywhere. Okay. Uh, we have some um, that are in residential facilities. We have some that are in therapeutic uh, foster homes that are in neighboring counties through a private child placing agency. And uh, we have several that are here in the county and our own approved foster homes as well. As um, just switching back to referrals for uh, child protective services, is that, have you seen an increase of that with kids going back to school now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we saw a decrease when, um, when kids were on virtual learning and once they went back in person, we saw an increase and they're back to being uh, what they were pre-COVID, if not higher. <laughs> and this is some of our adult numbers. Um, in fiscal year 21, we conducted 112 APS investigations. We average about nine new investigations per month. However, last month we did 20. 
Um, <laughs> if uh, we consistently have 20 a month, I may be asking for a new position, <laughs> but uh, we conducted 56 pre-admission screenings that we do along with the health department nurse. Um, we average about five of those per month. And that's uh, for folks that go into a nursing home or if they're eligible for Medicaid and they meet nursing home level, they can remain in their home and Medicaid can pay for an aid to keep them in the home because um, our goal with all of our programs is to keep folks in the least restrictive setting possible. So we average about 16 adult service cases per month and we average about 31 guardianship cases per month that we monitor for the port. And being um, state supervised and providing state and federal uh, mandate services, we are very closely monitored by the state and by the federal government. And uh, there's a multitude of reports some are monthly, some are quarterly, some are annual that measures our performance and how well we're meeting all of the mandates. And there's probably hundreds of mandates that we have to meet. Um, we go through a multitude of reviews and audits. Um, at any given time, we are going through at least one review or audit um, by the state. Currently, we are being audited on our purchase of services budget lines. And we just finished a review where our regional office reviewed our uh, Medicaid and TANF and VIEW programs. Um, and we're getting ready to go into another 4E review um, by the state. This is just an example of a, a few of the things. The state puts out what's called a dashboard report and they do that quarterly. And this is some of our results from the last quarter just to show how well we're performing, mm -hmm. that we are 100%. surpassing the target. And, um, and actually um, on this report, it, it compares us with the state and other agencies in our region. And we um, surpassed the state average and other agencies our size and other agencies in our region. And, and this is just a, a few, this is just an example of a few things that we're being measured in. Uh, we're measured in, you know, we're mandated. We have so much time to complete certain applications. And um, with SNAP, uh, there's, we actually, the state of Virginia is under a court order that 97% of SNAP applications have to be processed on time. And that's 30 days unless it's expedited. And then we only have seven days to process those. Um, so it looks at how quickly uh, we're processing applications. It's looking at certain CPS mandates and, and foster care mandates, um, APS mandates that we're required to meet. And so if you go to the next screen, this is just an example of another report. So safe measures. Um, is a data program that measures all of our child welfare <laughs> programs monthly. And so this, again, it's just an example of a few of the mandates that we're required to meet and the state monitors this monthly. Um, and I get a report from our um, regional consultants every month. Great job. So our staff does a really good job, and I just want to say Rocky Reed is here, and she's our CPS supervisor, and she and her staff are responsible for this. Yeah. Excellent job. They do an excellent job. Excellent. So you're fully staffed, Kim? We are fully staffed except for one position. Okay. That's good. Um, and so um, looking at the staff pay increase, uh, the governor included, or Governor Northam before he went out, he included a 5% pay increase for state supported local employees for fiscal year 23 and 24. Um, and so I heard yesterday what the Senate is recommending and what the House is recommending. So I uh, don't know yet what'll end up being the, um, 
what it will what it's going to end up being but then the next slide um i know mr doll included a five percent pay increase um, in his proposed budget for staff and so last year um we received a 5% pay increase and it ended up being 58.5% state federal funds for social services staff and 41.5% local funds. And so we never know what that formula, it's a very complicated formula to come up with that amount. And we don't know what that'll be until May, but, um, but that's what it was last year. So a 5% increase for our staff in fiscal year 23 would be 86,000. And if our um, formula is the same as last year's, it would come out to be uh, a little more than 50,000 of that would come from state and federal funds. And so um, I just wanted to talk real briefly about why this pay increase is so important. Um, when I took over as director of our agency, we were um, severely short-staffed. We were plagued with turnover and we were basically a training ground for larger surrounding uh, localities that paid considerably more. And over the past several years, um, you have approved additional positions for us that we needed. You've approved pay increases. You approved two uh, pay alignments for our staff over the last few years, and it has made um, a tremendous difference. Once we were able to start filling the positions, that we had the positions that we needed, we started paying people more, they were staying. Um, once this started happening, we were able to do more for retention. Um, once we got to that point, you know, we created an onboarding committee internally, um, because we assessed and created a plan for better onboarding of new hires, which um, I think helped even more so with our retention. We were able to focus more on team building activities and morale. Um, again, further improving our retention and our performance. Um, and then once we achieved sufficient staffing, we were able to make the internal organizational changes that we needed to further improve our processes, our reporting assignments, and our overall performance as an agency. And as you can see by our numbers, by retaining trained, experienced, and talented staff, we're providing better services um, to our residents. We currently have very experienced and knowledgeable and talented supervisory staff who are the experts in what they do. And they're providing excellent training, coaching, and support to the staff, which further improves retention. Um, we've been able to tap into these talents and make significant improvements in our technology, um, improving efficiency, making our processes less cumbersome, which further improves retention. So it all started with getting the positions that we needed and then getting pay where we needed it to be. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you the difference that it has made in our agency. And now that we're full staffed, and not only are we fully staffed, but the staff that we have have been there um, for a few years now. They've been there long enough to get trained. They're proficient in the jobs that they do. Um, and it's just, it's been tremendous. If I recall when you first took over, you had almost 20 20 percent turnover rate yeah, sounds mm -hmm. in 2016 me. we lost 16 employees which was half our staff half in 2015 staff. in july of 2015 in one month we lost three employees just to charlottesville social services uh -huh. and mm -hmm. and and so what's your retention rate now um, your rate, which are we look at we're last couple of years, I think we've maybe lost a couple of two or three, maybe if that a year. That's awesome. Out of a total of how many? 30 yeah. <laughs> we have um, 36 full time employees. Great. Great job. Great job. Um, and I know morale was an issue when you first took over as well, too, probably because of all the turnover as well, too. 
Right. And so we've really, and a lot of that was because um, we were short staffed anyway. Um, And then when you have the turnover, then you have a handful of people doing the work for a whole agency and, and people can't do that long-term. Um, and when Charlottesville and Albemarle were paying, you know, 10 to $12,000 a year more, Henrico pays 15 to $20,000 or more a year. It was really hard to compete with that too. And so um, helping get our salaries up has made a tremendous difference. And we just have such a talented staff right now and they do, an excellent job. And, you know, federal research shows that improving child welfare workforce issues improves outcomes for mm-hmm. children and families. And, and because of that, uh, Virginia actually was one of eight states selected to participate in a five-year project funded by the Children's Bureau and led by the Quality Improvement Center for Workforce Development at the University of Nebraska. I volunteered to participate in that project. So we were one of 18 localities in Virginia that uh, participated. And the goal was to develop workforce strategies for agencies to improve child welfare workforce issues, which in turn uh, will improve outcomes for children and families. And, you know, um, I look at the work that we do every day and it's a really hard job and the nature of what we do um, you know, workers experience secondary trauma. They're dealing with some really difficult situations and they do a really great job and they're staying. And um, I couldn't be more pleased with our staff. And so, you know, I just wanted to say with this pay increase, I really hope that you will approve it because in order to keep moving forward on this trajectory of a stable workforce, Uh, resulting in in improved outcomes for children and families, we need to continue to offer competitive salaries by taking advantage of state and federal funds when we can um, and give pay increases to staff and continue to be competitive. Excellent. Any questions from the board? Well, thank you for the outstanding job your team does and for everything you do to serve our citizens. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for all of your support. And there's a thank you slide at the end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you all for your time. Just one quick thing. So, so you asked about uh, voting. So Ms. Harris pulled it up. The 2020 general election looks like absentee and early voting was 66%. 66%. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, and there was uh, in that general election, we had eighty percent uh, voter turnout. Um, looks like there's nineteen. We had eighty percent voter turnout. That's awesome. Yeah, looks like we have just just a little nineteen thousand eight hundred forty registered voters, and um, yeah, fifteen nine thirty three total total voters. Yeah, registered in total. Okay, that's who actually voted. Yeah, gotcha. So 60 some percent of, of those who voted in early absentee or early voting. And I think that's like way, way up from previous years when you didn't have a 45 day window. I think it was probably less than 5% or something like that. that did early yeah, I don't, I don't know what it was previously <laughs> from the absentee piece, but yeah, I'm, I'm certain that the early voting has, has certainly increased that number. Yeah. All right. Significantly. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, next up, Fire Rescue Association, Mr. Lai and Mrs. Smith. Everybody. Uh, Chief Lai couldn't be here tonight. He's, Sorry, it's Mr. Mayo yeah. then, yeah. He, no. He's out of town. Um, those that don't know me, my name is Chris Alley. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Chief of the Fork Union uh, Station and also Vice Chair of the FRA Committee. Um, I don't have any slides, don't have any big presentation. We do thank you for everything you do. Um, I've got some notes from Chief Lai. He ran some numbers and how, what his formulas are, I don't know. But um, he, he sent me that our account, uh, Mr. Dahl proposed a 6% increase in operating expenses compared to last year. Um, but after 
running his numbers for this year and actual costs and proposed increases from the treasurers and and how he puts all that together. He's um his calculations are, are about 80, 87% of our operating costs are being funded, even after considering the stuff that's moved to contract services. The only thing that I would add to that is um, I noticed on the training budget for fire rescue classes, we asked for 35,000. Um, Mr. Dollars proposing 25. Um, if you have a firefighter one class and an EMT class, by the time you pay the instructors and stuff, you, you pretty much ate that up. Training is very expensive. Um, but it's needed to keep our people safe and also so we can serve our citizens the, the best we can. Um, and, and keeping in mind when you're working on this with the um, on the operation side, um, equipment, but I'm not just talking about vehicles, but like the, all the stuff that we put on the trucks, the tools we use, um, stuff around the firehouse, stuff, stuff is going up almost weekly anymore. We have no idea what things are going to look like at the end of uh, that operating year. I mean, it's, it, it's almost impossible to impossible to uh, pre-plan for that the, the way things are going now, and and until things get better and, and things are more available, uh, uh, it, that's just it's it's just the the animal we're in right now with with all the COVID things and all. Um, and that, that's really all the main concerns of, of the whole thing right now. Most most everything, most every other line item is 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 pretty much funded just just how we we sent it over. So I guess Chief Fly also sent over a, a request for a, a UTB. Yeah. So um, so Chief yes. Poland, Chief Poland. Uh, requested a UTV to kind of assist with, and then you all better talk about it, assist in storm conditions or, or things like that. I guess take the last snowstorm. What's a UTV, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a, um, like a, um, a company one has one. It's, it's like a, like a, like a side-by-side -side where, you know, you can yeah. seat four really, people in it. Not the four uh, wheeler, but the little, the little, uh, the, the two people ride it. Yeah, like a little yeah. It's like a little doom buggy. Yeah. When, when we have when we have storms like that, especially like the first storm when it's real heavy snow and a lot of trees fall, um, Kent Store, you know, everything over in Kent Store is pretty much a back road. Right. So once trees start falling, they get cut off from everybody else, and they did. Um, you know, uh, Company One couldn't get to them from their side. We couldn't get to them from our side. They were on their own. If anything happened, they were on their own. At one point, they had to abandon one of the um, one of the two uh, brush apparatuses that they have for a while, and then they finally got some tractors from local residents and stuff out to uh, move that stuff around. Um, they just need something to get around in, in those conditions. And um, yeah, Andrew uh, Chief Poland rather came to our FRA committee meeting and proposed the the county. Uh, put $20,000 in the budget towards the project and they would pay the rest. This project is that $20,000 will just about pay for the UTV. They're going to put a pump on it. They're going to, it's going to have a, a small fire pump, a way to, to move people, stuff like that. It's, it's probably a good 40, $45,000 project in the end. So they're, they're covering most of it. They're just asking for a little bit of help. Yeah. And, and we all, we all support that. How will they raise an additional, where's that additional funding come from? Uh, I, I can't speak on their uh, accounts. I don't know what they have, but some of it will be fire sir from their uh, aid to locality money or, you know, maybe money they have set aside from fundraising efforts over the years, uh, that kind of thing. Riders off the horse or whatever. Uh, 
the transport. So they'll have one in the area. Not the only one that won't have one there. So it's one in every fire station, except for it, it, it will be. It will be. It, okay. The lake has has one that they yeah. bought on their own. Uh huh. Okay. Days, two, three days before we got uh, was able to actually get some of the roads open in that area. What's that UTV that get around? Yeah. So will it will it have any use if we don't have snow? Can you use it for something else? Yeah. Oh, a lot of stuff. Can it use for a lot of things, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma so like the uh, the brush fire that we yeah. had. Yeah, um, my my breast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're being polite, aren't you? Yeah, the first part we had, then, um, yeah. We could use that to run the ship. Where we had the one for um, UTV out of Tom Meyer. Miss, I mean, I should ask you to come up just for the record so that you're in the microphone. Come on up, there's enough room. I'm going to plan on doing that. I have the moral support. Late 2015, uh, I had a four wheeler accident up in Hatfield McCoy, in southwest, uh, southern West Virginia. And I just thought about with the horses and on the trails. Um, and, and they sent in a UTV to get to me. and. Yeah, I would remember that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was in such condition yeah. that they almost pronounced me dead at the mm -hmm. hospital once they finally got in there. And had they not had that to get back in there to mm -hmm. me, no doubt I wouldn't be alive. Yeah. And so I think about you put somebody on a 1200 pound animal, yeah. and my own aunt has seen her break seven ribs come off of one. So what you're saying, man, you're all the way back there in those trails at Pleasant Road, and something happens. And Correct. Um, it can be a broken neck off of a horse or whatever. And so the thought of you all, six of you carrying a backboard all the way through the trail just isn't mm -hmm. it. correct. So we, we <laughs> use it at Pleasant Grove. We've used it um, uh, numerous times for county fairs or, or um, Monticello Man. Um, Water Rescue uses it, ours, or come ours as well uh, for that. But they have two of their own. Um, Searching for lost people. Yep. Uh, sure. It's great to go down access roads on the river for water rescues. Yeah. Fires on the railroad tracks is a, is a is a big thing because you can't get trucks down there. But there 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 are. Yeah. I'm probably forgetting about a whole lot of stuff we can use In them summary for. Summary to me, uh, we're, we're a one stop flight camp. Odds of you having to go deal with somebody off in the woods or in a remote area. Is it's great, and especially Kent Store. Yeah, because I mean, so, so if it um, for Kent Store, it would be a you know, 20 minute response if Tomar was notified, notified right away. So, why is one not being requested for 14 years? Hadn't been requested. Let's go ahead and request one. As we talked about I just don't, I, I don't think we necessarily need one right at the moment in the building. That, that, that request may come later. Um, Ken Store needs one more than we do. Um, we have some other projects going on. Um, I'm, I'm going to be at your meeting next week. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a, a plan set out myself and my officers over the next several years with money coming in to, to upgrade equipment and stuff like that. <coughs> That's just not on the high priority list for us right now, because once Ken store gets theirs, uh, we'll have three in the County. If I need one, I, I can get one fairly quick. Um, okay. 
it's, it's just not a priority for Fort Union right at the moment. But but I think I think you really should do this for company three. I appreciate you being fiscally mindful. We oh uh, we have we have like a um roughly a five year plan for like as long as the aid locality money keeps coming like it is and and different things as far as upgrading extrication equipment whatever else without trying to have to come to you all to ask for the money out of the general fund or the CIP. Um, uh, you know, and I'm sure over that time, if we found we got to spend some money where we weren't planning, we might have to adjust something back a couple of years, but none of it's anything that's trying to replace something that's not in working order. I mean, it, can, it can wait. So uh, we're, we try to do as much on our own as we can to ease the burden on the county. And then just to go back to that, you know, Chief Pullen reached out and I said, you know, just the process is you got to, you know, budgets are done. You just have to go through the FRA. And as long as the FRA, you know, put the request into the FRA instead of individual chiefs coming to the board, if the FRA approves it, then, then I'll bring it to the board. And that's why you have it. And again, it's necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily CIP from a dollar amount, but, but kind of the way it is, I would probably as the board is considering the CIP items, maybe we include it in that versus just funding yeah, it. You don't want to put it as a regular budget. Line no, or rather than putting it in an operational budget mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, and then to, what about the $10,000 in training? What was your? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I'll talk about that. I mean, so, so, so really all, all departments have, all departments have training budgets in their individual company budgets for training. And then this training budget, the original, originally why this was set up was training dollars more for um, uh, EMS providers. You know, back at, I don't remember when it was, but it, it was, you know, we had a tough time with getting volunteers. So the board and, and my predecessor put some dollars in the budget and I think worked with the FRA to put money in there to start providing funds for volunteers. For, for training um, EMS responders and stuff because we had a, we had a big need for it. So, I mean, if you just look at um, what's been spent year after year, I mean, it hasn't been any more than $20,000 in a year. So again, we funded 20,000 last year. And, and again, again, the last couple of years, you know, those are a little bit of a, not anomalies a little bit, but um, to go above and beyond, um, that to the full request. I just, we haven't done it previously. And um, if we if we start getting close to it, then I think the board will, will need to consider it. Response? Uh, well, that's also the only thing I would add to it. That's also what Ms. Smith pays the uh, firefighter, firefighter, fire instructors also out of. Um, so, it, you know, it, and it does fluctuate. Uh, she could probably tell you what the last lake's last firefighter one class cost um uh, we got one going on right now that that will, that will come out of the current operating year we're operating on too so all those numbers aren't in yet <laughs> well so historically since i've been in the position originally the, the training budget was up to forty thousand, but they weren't spending it so it each year it was cut to the point and i have had talks with john lie chief lie about um and I, they they have started a training um committee to put a, a much more organized training throughout the year and expand beyond just the firefighter one and firefighter two because there's a lot of stuff that we could be training on um and that once we are doing that where then we can come to you and present to you that you know with this twenty thousand dollars we got 12 <coughs> firefighter ones you know eight firefighter twos, instructors, et cetera, then we could start building it back up to the 40,000 and we're just not there yet. This actually will be the year we're in right now will be the first year that they've come close. Right now, I think they have about 17,000 left um, in 16 to 17. Um, and this will probably be the closest they will have come to spending it off this year so but i think as, as long as we can build that training committee and start expanding beyond just the basics then we can build a training from there and, and there has been some talks of having some of those higher level classes above firefighter one and two for those that that, that already have all that stuff 
you know, a lot of sure. stuff like the instructor classes and stuff like that. Right now, you got to go out of town for for officer level classes and stuff. And things. So, right, but we can have BPOs, DPOs, water classes, um, basic pump ups, and right, right, and sticko, pico. Yeah, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of certifications that we really need to start focusing on within the county. And so then, you think, I'm sorry. Oh, like I said, and then and then hopefully we will build the budget back up. And, um, and and be able to to do more and need more. Is it is the decrease in 2021 pretty much attributable to COVID? I mean, like, to Mr. Dahl's point, I mean, well, what we did spend twenty thousand and eighteen, sixteen thousand and nineteen, and then seven thousand, seven and a half thousand, eight and a half thousand, twenty and twenty. A lot of stuff got slowed down. Uh, matter of fact, we had a firefighter one class going. Um, we had to shut down for almost three, four months, and then they went back, and actually, the, it actually it hurt the students. The pass rate wasn't as good as normal for that, but I think that four-month break just, it, it just, it, it hurt the students. It really did. We had a lot of young people in that class. And again, so, so I didn't fund at my same level as last year. I increased by five grand this year. I just didn't fund the full request. Um, and then going back to the operational budgets, I mean, that's basically the money that gets, um, you know, divided out to each of the companies and stuff. And I, I did a 6% increase over the uh, last fiscal year. Yeah. Um, and then, and then just the last one, you know, kind of the big, a big piece and, and, you know, they could speak more, uh, probably more technically on this, you know, there's a lot of different testing. So a lot of those that are, that uh, Mr. Bell has up there, um, each company pays for individually. So the goal was to try and contract service that together, just one contract to where it makes the, it cheaper on each company or overall for us to uh, have it done. And then we know it's done annually as well. So then this would be done in a, in a joint fashion because to add to that, all of that is compliance stuff that, that has to be done too. It's not because we want to do it. My son, my son called me and I hit the wrong button. <laughs> I did that. I answered I hung up on the next side. Any other questions from the board? So back to the, uh, the item we were, line item we were just talking about the, the training. Um, so if I understand right, historically you've been sending people out to other places for the, the training or testing that you'd like to do here, is that right? I, I thought I heard you say something. We, we usually have a firefighter one and a firefighter two class available. And the, the goal, we have a new um, county training officer, but previous year's county training officer had a goal of, of each now each January trying to hold firefighter one, firefighter two and hazmat all together. Mm -hmm. And then tr maybe try every year to hold a EVOC basic pump ops rural water supply to get people released as drivers. But uh, historically, when it comes to like fire instructor one, instructor two, fire officer one, stuff like that beyond firefighter two, um, we haven't held those classes. And, and I think I think it would be a good idea to try to offer that to some of our more senior folks to broaden their. So training you abilities sending them out point. to other places. Those, those for that upper level, yes, they do go outside the county. Okay. So what I was wondering if that's if that's part of the justification for an increase to what the county's giving, then you were already spending the money in the past for those classes from the do it outside the county, right? Yes, because that money would come out of our funds. Um, I, I guess we we could turn in receipts to try to get some back out of that, but I don't. I don't think we. I, I don't think we've been doing. I know I have. So y'all been self funding it. We just been yeah, that stuff. We've been self funding that rather, the county or rather than getting it out of the county just, training budget. Just asking for the county wherever it's done to start. Well, yeah, I mean, it's one yeah. of those things. Do you do you have everyone have their own training budget, and so then you have a training budget here, or do you have one comprehensive kind of standardized? Yeah one training budget that's that's line item in here because right now you've got a training budget here 
but then every company has kind of their own training budget as well. That's not that it's a lot of money, but I see Mr. Bell's point of, you know, if you built to it, if you were to come back to the board and say, you know, we've, we've spent our training budget and we'd like discretionary, we'd like to do this program here. I'm sure that the board would probably approve that in a discretionary budget. Yes, sir. And, I, and I'm not arguing that. I just, I was looking over the stuff that was sent over to me today and looking at what we requested versus what uh, yeah. Mr. Dahl put in his budget. And um, I, honestly, I didn't know what the what the payouts were or, or anything. I just, I saw a $10,000 sure. difference and I figured I'd swing the bat and see how far the ball goes. But <laughs> get $10,000 towards your UTV now. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just, you know. <laughs> no, I, I think the, sounds like the board's in favor of the UTV. It's just really as to we'll probably pull yeah, that. Yeah, and like I, I think that's probably more of a conversation for, for next week during the CIP, CIP review yeah. and stuff like that. Anybody want to add anything, change anything? No. Then the only thing with the fire and rescue budget, again, you know, looks like in, let's see here, in some years we're going to have a couple things dropping off here. So there's a line in here called fire and rescue capital. And this is for in the past when the county has, because remember in the past, and we've changed that going forward when things have been purchased for Lake Monticello, Lake Monticello's purchased the equipment and it's in their name and we've provided the contribution. Going forward, any equipment the county buys, it's the county's equipment, it's in the county's name. Um, so there are a couple pieces of some funds that the county <coughs> pays towards one, the Lake Monticello building expansion, and also I think one of their pumpers that are gonna be falling off here within the next couple of years too. And that's 120,000 total per year. Uh, but otherwise, you know, their, their budgets, you know, not, not a whole lot of change. You know, you gotta pay for insurance. You gotta, you know, the county pays for line of duty insurance, um, vehicle insurance, general liability insurance for all, all the organizations, volunteer accident insurance, workers comp, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of big flexibility in, in, in those types of costs. Those are kind of hard costs that you can't really say, well, I don't want insurance. So, um, but yeah, it really kind of comes down to the training, some of these new things that they're adding in and then just really the operational budget. That's kind of really work some of the, you know, if there's any differences in what is being requested versus what I funded or what I proposed. All right, well, Chief Alley and Chief Mayo and Ms. Smith, thank you very much for all your help. Thanks to all the volunteers for everything they do and for all the great work that you guys do. Thank you to you all for everything in your consideration. All right, do we have anything else? We do not, we do not have a closed session. I think without Mr. Sheridan here, we probably shouldn't discuss the budget. No, and, and, and just, just to kind of go over that here. So, so March, March 2nd, we have um, a 5 p.m. regular meeting. Got a few things on there that we're just finishing up. And then at 7 p.m., we have um, kind of county department briefs. If, if there's any departments that want to come forward to discuss any budget that I didn't fund fully in, in my proposal, and then also CIP review. Um, you know, at this point, I, I don't remember Tori, what's the date we need to adopt the budget on or advertise the budget? Do you have your budget book with you? Um, but anyway, if I remember correctly, I think we pretty much, starting March 2nd, we basically have three dates, three or four dates to come up with an advertised budget to put out. And so, so really, I, I, I think probably starting March 2nd and moving forward, you know, whenever there's time for some budget uh, budget review and discussion i think we're going to be really getting into the budget at that point though. any new numbers from any of the other areas yet? no sure. we have a, i mean ever, what's that march 16th yeah so we have the second the ninth and the 16th um 16th we're gonna to have to put forward an advertised budget and i think on the 16th we have a work session at, at 5 p.m and then we've got a, a regular meeting at 7 p.m where the board would then decide what the advertised tax rate is and the budget. So, so three budget meetings to really kind of get into the weeds. So, um, you know, in your budget balance sheets that, that are in your budget books, that's really in the column for the budget balance sheet. That's really the difference of what I didn't fund in my budget versus what everyone fully requested, whether it's right. CIP or 
or just kind of line item things. So with the school's budget now in hand, where do we stand? Um, I mean, so, I mean, so really at this point, I mean, just, just with the school's budget at hand, their million dollar request is about three cents of the tax rate. So, so my budgets proposed at the current tax rate of that 884, so fully from the schools as it is, that's another, uh, another three cents on top of that. Okay. Um, you know, as you remember, as Mr. Sheridan, uh, Mr. Commissioner came up, you know, we're going to see some additional sure. values here. And I'll certainly reach out to him, um, you know, see if see if he's got any updates prior to the next meeting to see if there's anything. Um, but but yeah, that's we don't have any big changes at this point. There's a few small things that that, that have come forward, but nothing that's catastrophic at this point. So if we advertise a two dollar rate, we should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> So we always, Eric, yes. we always put in the budget what we think uh, Mel's going to tell us. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, in, in how much do we? How much do we do? How much how, is it already in? Mel on Mel's side. <coughs> I mean, you so, you're gonna wait until he. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what additional Mr. Sheridan is going to come up with, Mr. Mel yeah. Sheridan. I mean, I mean, again, he, he when he was here, if you remember, he said that he doesn't have his all of his vehicle values in yet at this point. And well, so he, that, he basically he, said that vehicle values went up 20% the previous year. This year was almost 30% on top of that 20%. Previous year, that was almost an increase of a million dollars. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a surprise if he came in with a surplus or well, additional I, revenues. Yeah. Of, I think, uh, I think he dollars. said also, and I don't, I don't remember what he quoted, he said there are a lot of properties that haven't received their certificate of occupancy right. That, right. that are close. I mean, right. and, and so once he knows they're, they're going on the books, he'll add those into the, right. into the value. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think we will get some amount of revenue and, and I, I can't say if it's going to be a half million, 200,000, it's going to be a million dollars. Like I said, I, I just have to rely on, on, on the values and the data that he provides. And how much is a penny? We it's about 330. And, and, then we'll, and, and by the next meeting, we'll get you some additional. Uh, I know in the past, the boards always like to see the kind of like the per penny chart. And um, just so if there's any questions, they can kind of see what that is. But it, inflation kind of, adjusted per penny chart. Yep. Just, you know, same. Yep. So it's about 330. If, if I remember correctly, that's that's what it is. Um, so so again, like I said, you know, starting next week, and again, it's going to be a little different this year. You know, we we didn't want to be moving around from like from different locations, so we're going to do our budget work sessions here. So it's going to be a little different setup, and and we'll have to see how it works. And um, it doesn't have kind of like the the, the closed in. Um, you know, budget work session like we did at the library or or in the Morris room and stuff like that. Sure. But but with just having multiple meetings and regular meetings, it's just kind of hard to kind of go back and forth. It's fine. So, and right. Tony, yes, ma'am. I looked up the census poverty was six point nine. So you're right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And actually, Ms. Mabe's department is serving twenty two percent of the population of Fluminense. If you take the twenty seven thousand. 727,270. Yeah, so divided by the 50. That's too much information. So, so soon it could be 25%. It's the same, 22. 21 Well, I had to make up for the fact that I said 4% to begin with. So, you know. All right. Uh, any other any other business? Uh, no closed meeting. No closed I'll entertain a motion to adjourn then. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. We are now adjourned.